Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us at the Legal HR Summit. The Legal HR Summit is a two-day online event hosted by Youth Laboris, the largest employment law alliance in the world. This session is a part of the EREP blog and will be followed by other curated sessions of the region. I am now turning over to Orly Gebri to begin the session. Go ahead, Orly, you are welcome to start. Thank you very much, Isadora. Welcome, everyone, to our great panel. We're going to speak about how do you create a sense of community in teams when everyone is working from home? This is a big question. So I'm Orly Jerby. I'm the head of the employment and labor team in Herzog, Fox and Neiman, the US Laboris firm in Israel. And I am joined by a wonderful panel to discuss these challenges. So I have here with me Bartek Roszkowski, uh, the managing partner of the Polish US Laboris firm, Roszkowski. He has over 25 years of experience in advising corporations on employment law. Hi, Bardek. Hello. Um, we have here um, Agnieszka Jonko. Agnieszka is a general counsel of Skanska, Central Europe. Before joining Skanska, Agnieszka was managing legal department in HP for 11 years. Before that, she was uh, working in international law firms. Um, and then finally, last but not least, we have here Lisa Weather. Lisa is an HR unconventionalist who uses design methods to build employee experiences. She's originally from California, but currently living in Stockholm and working at Fisher Brain at, as a people and culture partner. I heard that Fisher Brain is a very successful app for fishermen, and it's going to be a very interesting. By the way, it was very hard for me to pick one sentence to each of this wonderful uh, group. Anyway, let's start. So basically, in addition to other to its other challenges, COVID-19 crisis forced many employers to shift employees out of the office to work remotely. This shift created many legal, practical, HR, and cultural challenges. Uh, we will do our best to flag these challenges and to discuss it from different perspectives, but let's start with some legal analysis in this regard. So Bartek, um, in your experience to date, what are the most significant legal challenges that your clients are facing in this transformation? Uh, thank you, Orly, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to speak to this uh, group. We already have 60 people online, and people are uh, still joining. Um, there are challenges. The first challenge that we had to face at some point was whether or not you could decide out of hand that people would work remote. <laughs> because in many jurisdictions, that was far from obvious. Uh, sometimes there are regulations on when and how you can tell people to work at home. Sometimes there are formalities to follow before you're allowed to tell people to work from home. And of course, I won't go into details because it will be different in every country. But this is the first thing that every HR person, every manager has to ask themselves. Am I allowed just out of hand to tell people go and work from home? Sometimes there might be formalities to follow. Sometimes there might be issues. Uh, I think that in many countries, COVID, emergency COVID uh, legislations have made this process easier. Uh, in Poland, in fact, very quickly already in spring, they lifted all the barriers so that uh, differently than before, employers could just come up to employees and say work from home tomorrow and that's it. Uh, but this is something to look into. Another important thing is that there may be costs related to employees working from home because normally they come to the office, they have the computer, they have the pen, they have the paper, they have the printer, they have the Xerox machine, they have everything. Now to do the same work from home might require incurring some costs. And of course, it seems quite obvious that you give people a laptop, those people who work from home, but there, that might not be the only cost. Uh, they may have to print something out. Uh, do they have a printer? Do you deliver the printer? Who pays for the printing cost? Who pays for the, uh, for the, for the paper? Um, then they will, tell, they will tell you that they have a bigger phone bill 
because now they are calling everybody from, you know, from the home line or whatever. They will sometimes they come and say, you know, I, of course I have internet at home, but now since I'm using this internet mostly for work purposes, why don't you reimburse the cost of the internet? So the second issue is costs that we have to, uh, to look into uh, whether we should cover them, what of those costs we should cover, whether there are very formality, any formalities, whether we should sign any contract with the employee in this respect, and whether there are tax issues, because of course, of, always that there is a transfer of money, uh, a tax lawyer has to be consulted. Uh, another issue is privacy. Uh, we have had situations when employers were, because obviously working from home means working on Teams, right, or on Zoom. So almost you have almost all day Zoom meetings, uh, team meetings, in between you try to type something. But there is a lot of this online participation. And here, um, managers, especially in internal meetings, but also in external meetings, managers have came up to employees and said, you must switch on your camera. Because for an internal meeting, we must create a, a sense of interaction and you know we have to try to do as best as we can what we can't do in the office, which is at least to see each other faces. Uh, and you know, see how you speak and see, and see you. Um, sometimes they have this requirement for external meetings too saying, look, you're talking to the client. Why do you can't hide yourself from the client? You, you have to show yourself. And the employee will tell you, but I can't because there are children running around, because there is my wife who is not completely dressed, walking behind me, and so on and so forth. So there are privacy issues. Um, and the last one, probably not the last one, but one of the uh, other ones that I wanted to mention, a very important one, is working time working time. Uh, again, uh, every country will have their own uh, working time regulation, so no point going into any details, but it is important to bring it to the attention of the managers, of the HR managers, and the line managers of the people, that people are outside of the office, you don't know how much they work. In the office, you can at least see if he's, is he sitting after hours, at what time, more or less, at what time he's coming. In some countries, and by now, in all of the EU countries, you should already have strict regulations on evidencing working time, registering working time. After, the, after one of the rulings of the European Court of, the Court of uh, Justice of European Community, of European Union from, I don't know, a year or two years ago, uh, there is a clear requirement under European law to register working time. Not only work in overtime, but registering working time. So you should be aware at what time, and you should register it in, I don't know, whatever instrument, at what time the employee is starting work, at what time they are finishing work. It is a requirement. You need to see if your laws in any way change this requirement when people are working from home. In Poland, the law is the same. You are required to register people's working time minute to minute. So it's not like they're supposed to start at nine and finish at five. So I write in nine and five. It's illegal. If he comes to work at 8.57, you should register 8.57. And if he stops work at 5.13, you should register 5.13. And here I am going into details because this is European law. This is not Polish law. I'm not sure to what extent different jurisdictions have already come into terms with this requirement coming from the, uh, from the case law of the European court, but they should have, and if they haven't, they will. And of course, working from home is a huge field of abuse for employees, because who hasn't had cases when they worked one hour in the morning, one hour at night, and then they said that the entire period of time between these two hours is also working time. We have had cases like this. We have had litigation when employee just was in the custom of, of getting up at seven o'clock and working, working, working until nine. Then he disappears for 12 hours, does God knows what, and opens the computer again at 9 p.m. and works two more hours. And then when he gets conflicted with the employer, says, oh, it has been 14 hours every day. 
and now go and try to battle this claim and prove that he did it. Now, so again, uh, we won't have a solution because every country will have a different uh, regulation, but working time is something definitely to look into how to prevent this overtime, how to prevent overtime, how to make sure that they won't claim overtime when they really didn't work in overtime, when they were not instructed to work in overtime. The last issue, the last, last, I know, uh, is we don't have them in the office, but we have to do different things with them. We have to sign the employment contract. We have to terminate employment contract. We have to sign an amendment to employment contract. We have to receive a vacation leave application. We, for all the time, we have been doing this on paper. Employment contract is a paper object. Notice of termination is a paper object. Now, you don't have these people to give them a paper. You don't have these people around to give them a notice of termination. You, don't, you can't call them into the HR office and say, and say, sign this amendment to your employment contract for me because we need to change something. They are away. So we need to think about how to deal with those issues that we have been doing on paper, digitally and remotely. And again, it is quite certainly different in every jurisdiction, but this is something to look into, to remove paper from your HR. We looked into it very closely in Poland, which is quite a backward jurisdiction in terms of legal solutions. And we have found out that, in fact, you can remove paper from HR entirely. When you look into it well, you will see that you don't need one sheet of paper in your HR. You can move to digital completely. And in fact, this is something that COVID is bringing up to our attention. But when you remove COVID and you look at it objectively and think like we are in 21st century, think about 2040 or 2050. And I ask you the question, in 2050, will there be employment contract on paper? Of course, there won't. In 2040, will there be notices of termination on paper? Of course, they won't. So we are bound to remove paper from HR. And COVID is only bringing this to our attention at this moment. So it's not a question of, will I be sitting on this paper forever or not? It's only the question when you will remove paper from HR, because you will. You will. It's also cost. There has been some surveys in America which said that HR, that up to 30% of the working time of HR people is looking for the paper. Where is this goddamn paper? Where is this employment contract? Where is this file? Up to 30% of their working time is looking for the paper. Besides, we have had a client recently with whom we talked about this. Look, you can remove paper from, uh, uh, from HR completely. And in many countries, you have to have the, 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 the file of the employee, like the, the, you know, the personal file where you have his contract, his old documents and everything. And for instance, in Poland, you are obligated to keep that file for 10 years after he leaves your work, he leaves your company. Keep it for 10 years. We spoke to a client and said, la, 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 you know, on the basis of the, this COVID brings this to our attention, we can remove paper from, from HR. And they said, we can. But we have just started building a building to store our personal files of employees, because we have 15,000 of them, and we needed a building. We're constructing a building. How much does it cost? Millions. So this is something, all catastrophes in the history of the world moved civilization forward. This catastrophe is also moving it forward. And if this move is to remove paper from HR, COVID will stay in our memory as having done actually one good thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bardic. Well, this is some kind of an optimistic message. Um, I would like to turn to Lisa. So we spoke about, you know, challenges of, of costs and privacy and working hours and stuff like that, which are all legal aspects that takes us to some trust issues, engagement issues. And here's what I would like you to focus on, you know, give us employers, your advice for addressing these issues from a practical and, and HR perspective. 
how to create this kind of engagement? How do you know we will solve these legal aspects, but what do we do to keep people on board? Uh, before that, Lisa, I will just want to add a, a poll question to the audience. Uh, Isadora, if you can uh, put the slide uh, of, the Q of, of the poll. Um, you are more than welcome to add your views and to share with us, you know, Bartek spoke about uh, prior to COVID, COVID and post COVID. So it's very interesting to see uh, your answer regarding the questions, did your organization have a significant percentage of workforce working remotely prior to COVID-19 crisis? While you are answering uh, this question, um, Lisa, if you can share with us your experience and then we will share the answers with everyone. Sure, absolutely. Um, it definitely is difficult. <laughs> There's no straight and easy answer in terms of like resolving engagement during COVID. Um, especially our organization was more or less 100% on site with a few spots of like doing some work from home work. Um, and then we more or less went 100% remote overnight. And Definitely, I mean, that is really difficult from a perspective of understanding the employee experience because we had designed a lot of things to be in person. And I would say we are quite good in the sense of being digitized. Um, uh, Bartek, we have no paper. <laughs> uh -huh. <No>. So <laughs> we're doing good on that on that, on that that forefront, but um, it's, it's a lot deeper than that. It's a lot deeper than just meeting people in person. And I think there's a lot of, um, underestimated value in the connection that you have with people um, from the creative work, but also just like the day-to-day -day interactions. And so we, we definitely did the approach of like, you know, the happy hours and like creating some um, games and moments for people to meet. But of course, people come into that Zoom fatigue. And so we had to kind of also learn like, what's the next step after that? And something we really realized was like people's connection to the organization. And what does that mean? Um, especially like most um, organizations have like an offsite or something. And that's a really great gathering place. And that's not possible right now. So we had to pivot into like a virtual option and of course in the beginning we're like ah we'll just wait it till next spring or early summer and then we really realize that it's just beyond like a fun activity it really is a place for people to meet and communicate so um what we have designed in our people on culture team and what we're quite lucky with um with the product that we work is around fishing is that we can do stuff outdoors and it still connects to our culture it still connects to our product so we had a fishing tournament where we um set up cross collaborating teams of uh, different, like the, the units that they don't usually work in to meet up and go fishing twice um, during one month. And then now we have a deconstructed offsite where we've created an event where um, we want people to think about what the future is for fish brain. And now they have to work together on like a virtual whiteboard, use user interviews um, and connect again with a whole different team than they've ha ever had before. So the thing that like is really kind of um, easy to happen is silos get created during these times when you don't create these cross collaboration um, activities. So for us, it's really important. And also just to remember the human touch. I think something that um, I've come across that really resonated with me from other HR people is to realize there's not one experience. Um, like saying, so for instance, I'm lucky. I, I live with my, um, my partner and his kids and I I'm desperate to find alone time. Like I really want it. So my experience is really different than a younger engineer that lives by themselves and potentially is an international to Sweden and doesn't really know the city very well. They're going to feel quite lonely and they're going to need more interaction. So I think also to understand from a management perspective or um, head of HR is to know that the things that you create won't be a one size fits all. You're going to have to create sometimes niche things in order to cover ground of your entire organization. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Isadora, can you, uh, can you uh, show us the results of our first uh, question? Okay, so part of you did uh, uh, work uh, remotely before that, but I'm sure this uh, COVID-19 expedited and accelerated uh, processes that were in the past and the majority uh, said no, so it's definitely interesting. 
Uh, before we will move on to Agnieszka, I would like to ask you another question. Uh, Isadora, if you can please uh, put on the screen the other question that we prepared. Um, so after listening to Lisa, has your organization implemented any new program supporting employees' mental or physical health since the start of COVID-19 crisis? Uh, this is part of the things that we discussed. Um, it is okay, you know, to uh, put some uh, um, Zoom, a party uh, via Zoom and uh, and also cook, cooking uh, workshop, etc. And I see many of my clients are working on very creative uh, ideas. Uh, not like you, Lisa, but still, you know, uh, we are trying to do our best. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are other uh, additional challenges that we need to face more than, you know, um, making uh, people happy, but even, you know, to, um, to face some uh, difficulties that the employees are suffering due to working from home, uh, alone, burnout, et cetera, that I'm sure that you are all facing. So if you can answer our uh, question here, just, you know, as a note for uh, before uh, we would move on to, uh, to Agnieszka, that would be great. Um, and while you are responding, um, I'm going to move on to Agnieszka and ask you, Agnieszka, you are a general counsel and you manage sizable teams of lawyers and you know, there are part of them are in other countries. So uh, it, 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 makes, it makes things much more complicated and challenging uh, in this regard. How do you, how would you describe the differences between managing in office team and the remote one? What are the challenges that you are facing and what are the adaptations that, uh, that you've made to manage uh, during these uh, challenging times? Agnieszka, please. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me in the first place. Uh, I'm, um, uh, I'm a general counsel in Skanska Central Europe, um, and I manage uh, 36 uh, lawyers located in five countries. So we kind of had remote management before, but this, is, this time is of course different because we cannot travel, we cannot meet in person, and uh, the challenges we face are really now harder than ever because we are in a construction company. So in a construction company, the sites are open and blue collars are, cannot work, of course, remotely. You cannot build a building remotely. So it's a really like on-site job. So we have a lot of people working normally and we have support functions that work from home because of course we encourage people to work from home to decrease the risk for them. But how to combine these two, um, these two different way of working? And also um, what, we, what we do now uh, as lawyers, we try to maintain profitability. So it's not uh, easy now to uh, really maintain profitable business when there is COVID and uh, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, vacancies and, and some challenges in finishing the, the project. So this is also the, the lawyer's job at the moment, then to secure the work for the next year. So helping business to prepare offers, to conclude new agreements. So it's a, it's a, a lot of business issues to be solved. And also we have a, like a lot of new regulations. We just face them every day. It's something different, different um, regulations regarding uh, lockdowns or um, as, uh, government subsidies, subsidies and so on. We also have to maintain the like compliance and corporate governance. So we just cannot alone that because of COVID we are, we just can uh, abandon on all our internal rules. So there are a lot of, a lot of challenges and uh, how to manage all this. Of course, the team is more important than ever because we um, we have to go in a same direction. Business sometimes may want to pull string in a, this way or another, but we have to be as lawyers, we have to be a kind of a spine of the organization going in the right direction, no matter what. So that, that's my first point in all this, that people tend to be united uh, around goals. 
when they have a common goal, they feel like a team. They have this feeling of community. And usually, normally, we have like a lot of operational goals. We have to um, achieve this or that, or we have uh, strategic goals. So what we are heading at, what's our like long-term strategy. And also at the third level, we have values of the company. So what is really makes us different than others. And Skanska has great values. Like we care for life. We, we are better together. We are, act transparently and ethically. And these values are actually now more important than ever. I realized that I have to repeat the values to my people more often than, than, than before. Normally we mention values like once a year or twice a year maximum, but now it's like really have to be repeated that what is our main goal? Why are we working here? Why? because we want to help business in an ethical way. And then it really makes people, all right, I'm doing the good thing. I'm, I'm productive, but also I'm kind of safe here because I'm working in a, in a compliant, in a good environment. It's a good feeling for a lawyer, really. Um, so, so this is one thing, like goals that are a little bit changed. The other thing is, is that um, people need to, uh, like more visibility of the leader. This is what I uh, realized that um, because we, they do not see me in any of the offices because I used to uh, travel a lot and I used to organize a lot of meetings. Now it's all gone. So, um, and I, and I, uh, so I decided to keep the rituals on. So we do have meetings virtually in a various uh, groups of people because I have my direct reports. So we have status meetings. I have all hands calls with all our with all my employees and also i have one-to-ones that are really uh, going as planned but also what i realized is that people in their groups they um that i i have a, i would like to have contact with them and i want to speak to them so so then i joined from time to time i joined the meetings of particular groups of lawyers just to talk to them to have to give them opportunity to ask me a question, to actually um, and to increase this sense of the of community and maybe to repeat once again what we are doing and correct the actions if needed, right? So 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 another thing is this increasing of visibility and also being transparent in all that so that to, to admit what are the challenges and what solutions are proposed. And, and really it's, it's important for people. And the, and the third thing I, I really noticed that, that helps is, is showing people a lot of appreciation to celebrate successes because they, um, they really do a lot of good things now. And uh, I, I mean, not only celebrate like uh, one court case uh, or successfully concluded settlement. These are big things, but, but like very small things, good advice to the business, good opinion, um, good review of the contract or, or in, uh, help in implementation of the new regulatory, um, regulatory provisions. Something that really contributes to the benefit of the whole organization, but is this this is a success of the lawyer. And, and uh, I, I've noticed that people really appreciate this and they feel needed and they feel united and, that, and they have this feeling of, of doing something good. So, um, so yeah, so I would say um, uh, not to overcomplicate this, uh, this three things. So, so common goal at a little bit higher level increasing of visibility and showing people appreciation, celebrating successes. Thank you very much. That's very, very interesting. Uh, Isadora, if you can show us the results of our second uh, poll question. Um, wow, that's very impressive. <clears throat> the organization implemented the new program supporting employees' mental or physical health. So most of you said, yes, this is very impressive. Um, Lisa, can you share with us maybe your thoughts about this uh, 
types of programs or uh, inputs uh, in this regard of, you know, um, how to deal with the difficulties of people that are working uh, remotely? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think definitely like the, the best place for sure is like foundation, like Agnieszka is talking about is, the, you know, really connecting to the why um leadership visibility the values and i get the recognition like that is like the core foundation in terms of moving forward but of course you know there's going to be people that slip through and have a hard time and for us what we have um recently implemented is having a health coach so and specifically to talk about stress um and so this health coach works uh four sessions, one hour each in a, in a group setting for people to be able to talk about how to cope with stress. Like, what does that mean in different aspects of your life? And then something that's been really helpful for us is that we've now created a more consistent like people managers meeting, because obviously this is a lot of strain on people managers as well. Like they have to lead, but also they're a part of this type of crisis as well. So making sure that they know that they can lean on each other and not just expect only it from HR. It's also to use your as a community of people managers and something that has been a huge inspiration for me in terms of it's not really a program but something I really instill in terms of learning is stuff um, from a place called the Neuro Leadership Institute so they use a lot of like brain-based science and like understanding how we communicate and like how we interpret threats so right now during this COVID situation it's a high threat time because people are really uncertain so they use um, a lot of uh, it's something called scarf. So it's uh, uh, I keep sorry, just real quick, I can't remember, but it's like this acronym of uh, like status, certainty, autonomy, um, relatedness, and fairness. And so feeling any of those threats to any of those areas will cause you a tremendous amount of stress. So something that's really quite easy for our managers to implement is like being clear about your goals, being clear about your roles, being clear about kind of the boundaries creates a lot of certainty. And then also in terms of status is asking people for a lot of permission instead of just demanding that creates a lot of like, okay, you're not just the boss that's just telling me what to do. So for us, I've been trying to implement a lot of those type of brain-based learnings in order to help reduce that stress overload. And then for people also to recognize like, I'm not in a good place. Sometimes it's really hard for people to kind of come to, to a matter of understanding like, yeah, this has been bothering me. And even though we live in Sweden, our largest market is the US and I'm an American myself. Like, and I didn't think the election was gonna bug me as much as it has, <laughs> but it does. And it's like, things just really creep on you. Um, and so for us, it's just really important to understand the value of com communication and how we're doing it. And again, sent with a lot of like the foundation that Agnieszka has brought up. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Um, so um, you are more than welcome to uh, uh, add comments or questions into the Q&A. Uh, function and uh, we will be more than happy to answer. At uh, the meantime, we have uh, uh, a comment or maybe a question, Bartek, maybe for you uh, from Frank. Thank you, Frank. Employer's responsibility is also extended to ergonomics when working from home. Uh, so I guess this is another item that, you know, that we can add to the list of the uh, liability maybe, or uh, how do you treat uh, maybe a accident or safety while working uh, remotely? So maybe you can elaborate in this regard. Yes, this is a big issue. Uh, again, every country will have different uh, re regulations in this respect. Some countries will have horribly complex and vast regulations. Poland has a law on health and safety at work, which has well, which has hundreds of rules, hundreds of rules, including how many lacks of light must be in the working uh, room, how much uh, surface uh, there should be of the floor in your workspace, what your sitting, what your chair should be like, and the hundreds, the hundreds. Now, of course, nobody ever has had any reflection on whether or not all that stuff should apply to the home working station. Nobody has ever, it's never occurred to any legislator 
that you know that people might be working at home and then when you when you legislate like crazy for 200 rules on these details of uh, health and safety do you also does this also uh, apply at home nobody has to, so we have to think about it the legislators we the, we the lawyers have to always think about those things that the legislators didn't think about so this is one of them now so how does it work do you have to ensure all that at home or don't you I will give you an answer because this answer will be different in every uh, in in your in every country. But this is something to look to look into. Then he will fall from his chair, or whatever other things will happen. Will you be responsible for this accident at work or not? Does your is your responsibility risk based, which means you will be always liable because it is an accident at work, or will you be uh, free of liability if you have done? you know, whatever was required to be done. Then, if those uh, health and safety regulations do apply to homework, then in, in, in the entirety, or at least in the part, then do you have a way to check if they are observed? Do you have, can you require the employee to allow you to inspect his work, his, you know, his study where he works? Uh, and how that works. So this, these are indeed other very important legal issues. Health and safety at home, to what extent we are responsible for it, same as in the office, and how we should be able to inspect whether those rules are observed. Thank you, Bartek. Um, basically, um, I have a question to you, uh, mm -hmm. Bartek. Um, because we are, at the end of the day, we are lawyers. Yes, uh, and you, both want, of us. you want to ask this question in, in front of 83 people? <laughs> and um, I think I, what I would like to, to, this, us to think about is how do we implement the, the, the tips and advice that we got from Lisa and from Agnieszka into our field, not only as managing employees, but rather managing um, clients' relationships which is a very uh, significant part of our job. And now when handshake is out and the masks are in, how on earth are we going to keep this relationship going, you know, without all these routines, nice routines, the, 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 the that face-to-face -face conferences and meetings and handshakes and hugs and business travel, et cetera. What do you think, Bartek? Uh, Oli, we have, I think we lawyers who at some point become partners in law firms, have a fundamental problem with, consider, with, with still considering ourselves lawyers while our role is changing completely. We become part-time lawyers, but full-time managers. And this is, to a large extent, a nightmare because we have never been trained for this job. We have never went to business school we don't know things that normal managers study in the university for five years. Nobody teaches us this. And all of, this, all of a sudden, just because of progressing in the legal career, not in management career, you know, we end up not being lawyers, but managers. And this is indeed a huge, I find it a huge challenge. I find it a huge challenge to do the job for which I never applied, for which and which I never asked, but which is on my head to manage the organization. It is, it's interesting, it's challenging, it is fascinating, but difficult, difficult for a lawyer, you know, uh, to implement, to, to manage people and to manage the organization, very difficult. And so we should be listening to wise people like uh, Lisa and Agnieszka, who is in a similar situation because she also never asked to be a manager. She was also wanted to be a lawyer, but she was, too good a lawyer to stay a lawyer. So they make her a manager. Uh, and we should be listening to wise people like Lisa and, uh, you know, try to implement things like, you know, uh, she said. Well, that's indeed challenging. Um, Agnieszka, moving on to you. So maybe, you know, you can uh, provide us with some tips how to assign tasks, how to monitor tasks, and all you know together with what you previously said about still um, creating and maintaining this uh, um, um, 
sense of community in a way of you know, uh, teamwork and other uh, values that are very important to our role. Right. Um, I agree with what Baltic said. Uh, this is actually the truth about lawyers being managers at the same time. We kind of learn in a battle, I would say. So uh, we, we really um, become more and more experienced and this is uh, how, we, how we learn. Of course, we uh, then notice that it is necessary to gain some theoretical knowledge as well. So we uh, have additional class, some postgraduate studies, and there is a lot of, a lot of efforts to really keep up. But uh, coming to your question, um, well, about the assigning tasks, now the, chain, the, the, the times are different. It's not, we, we do not uh, have micromanaging anymore because it, we, can, we have no time to this and there is no way how to micromanage these times. So now we have times of empowerment of people. So we need to assign like general tasks and allow them to really work towards the goals themselves. And this is really something that requires even more attention from the point of the leader, because you have to cite a good boundaries how this task is to be done. But task is to be uh, actually uh, executed from the beginning to the end. So, uh, so actually, this is like giving the direction to the, to the employee what really uh, he should what he uh, she should achieve more than what he should do it's mm -hmm. like so so it's a di completely different way of, of managing people than before of course what helps is like that when you assign tasks you have your camera on i always uh, i think that that the leader should have a camera on and Baltic mentioned this this uh, privacy issue we cannot force, of course, employee to have their cameras on, and it's uh, completely fine. They can, they can uh, kind of be hidden. But the leader, uh, especially when when he talks about the goals and the tasks, should have the, the camera on. That's that's essential. And also, what helps are our old slides, PowerPoint slides, because when we talk, sometimes at the end of the talking. We just switch the switch off the the camera and the computer, and then uh, this is this way of uncertainty because there is no colleagues around to ask. But what should we do? And what was this about? So it really helps to have some slides uh, and then to send them to meeting participants and even very simple messages. Then then can associate the, um, the actually the uh, the your memory with the slide. Yeah. So uh, COVID is really increasing this uh, visual revolution we are, we are having, that people really look at things and then follow rather than, rather than listen. Yeah, yes, so. I, thank you. I was asked by the way, Bartek and the Agnieszka about the privacy issue with via Zoom, um, whether the background function, you know, maybe solved uh, part of the problem that you are not, you know, you don't have to see, you don't need to see the living room or bedroom or whatever, and you have some kind of a background or formal background, so maybe it solves part of, of the problem, but I guess the problem is still there if the kids are shouting around or running around, uh, uh, so it still uh, may uh, create problem problems. And by the way, I know a um, um, few organizations that are insisting that the camera will be on, um, taking into consideration the difficulties and maybe the legal uh, challenge or whatever, but you know, still, the idea and the, and, and the principle of seeing each other, you know, seeing each other and not just hearing each other, which creates some kind of, uh, you know, more of uh, gathering feelings or, uh, you know, being together, you know, trying to feel like we are at the office uh, in a way. So it's a very interesting thing. I think all this working uh, from, home, from home issue is here to stay. And I think as we, as we saw, the challenges are huge, uh, legal, HR, managerial, and cultural. I think the cultural challenges are the most important ones to deal with. The rest will, the rest will, uh, will be solved, you know, and we will have case law and legislation and whatever. But still, you know, at the end of the day, we need to create, you know, the uniqueness of our place. And, uh, and working remotely may 
um, may show that the differences are not that big and you are not that unique. So I guess, I guess this is the challenge that uh, organizations are, are face, facing now the most. I would like to thank you very much um, to Bartek, to Lisa, to Agnieszka. Um, I know I learned a lot. I hope all of you enjoyed and learned. And I, I wish you a pleasant uh, conference and stay safe, all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have now reached the end of the session, but the Legal Way Trust Summit is not over yet, as we have many other sessions coming up today. On your screens, you can see the titles of the next simultaneous sessions. Finally, I would like to thank everyone for attending this session, and thanks also to our panelists for their great insights. So with that, the session will now be ending, and I hope to see you at the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you.